Welcome to the IEF's webinar on the Agriculture Water Infrastructure Program Stream 2 Community Projects. My name is Alana Wilson, and I'm a program manager with IAF. Before we begin the presentation, I'd like to acknowledge that IAF's office is in Victoria, the traditional territory of the Lekwungen First Nations, represented today by the Esquimalt and Songhees Nations, and that the IAF operates across traditional and unceded Indigenous territories throughout British Columbia. Today, I am presenting from the unceded traditional territory of the Sashat and Hupachesa First Nations. AWP is funded by the Government of British Columbia through the Ministry of Agriculture and Food and is delivered by IAF. I am joined today by a few members of the BC government who will be assisting me during the question and answer period of the webinar today. First is Stephanie Tam, representing the Ministry of Agriculture and Food. Stephanie, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Oh, well, sure, Alana. Um, Stephanie Tam from the Ministry of Agriculture and Food. I'm the water management engineer based on the Abbotsford office. Thank you, Stephanie. Second, we have Ray Riley, a senior authorization specialist representing the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship. Ray, would you like to say hello? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Ray Riley from the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship. I'm a senior authorization specialist with the water team based out of Penticton, and uh, I am a statutory decision maker under the Water Sustainability Act. Thank you, Ray. Next, we have David Johnson, a dam safety officer representing the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship to assist us with any dam related questions. David, would you like to give us an introduction? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Alana. I can't add a whole lot more than that. I'm uh, the regional dam safety officer for the West Coast region. And uh, my role would be to administer the dam safety regulation with regard to any uh, infrastructure improvements. Thank you, David. And last, we have Queenie Yip, a dike safety officer representing the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship to assist us with any dike related questions. Queenie, would you like to give us an introduction? Hi, everyone. Uh, Queenie Yip, Flood Safety Engineer based in South Coast, Surrey. I'm also a Deputy Inspector of Dikes. Okay, so here's a brief agenda for today's presentation. We'll be covering an overview of the program, a more detailed overview of Stream 2 and how to apply to Stream 2, and the presentation will be followed by a Q&A. The Agricultural Water Infrastructure Program aims to increase adoption of efficient irrigation infrastructure and improve agricultural water supply and management in BC. The program's goal is to improve water security in agricultural areas and food security in BC. AWP aims to maximize available water, increase agricultural production, and protect agricultural land from flooding. Funding for AWP is available through four funding streams, each with their own unique funding limits, eligibility requirements, and other details. Details about Streams 1 and 3 are available on IEF's website. More information on Stream 4 is coming soon, and today we'll be covering the details of Stream 2 community projects. So let's get into Stream 2. Before we get into the nitty-gritty, I want to encourage you to check out the AWP Stream 2 webpage for full stream details. Especially as we get into the activity slides, I'll be overviewing things in much less detail than there is online. So for the most complete source of information, please review the webpage. So Stream 2. This stream focuses on community projects that have a strong commitment to agriculture, including those that try to expand current water systems to serve additional irrigated lands. This helps support community-owned water infrastructure that brings long-term services and benefits to multiple agricultural water users to increase food production. Successful applicants will receive cost-shared funding to improve water use efficiency, water security, water availability, or drainage conditions for agricultural communities. Each stream has their own unique funding limits, eligibility requirements, and other details. So for Stream 2, there is no minimum funding amount. Maximum funding will either be $1 million or $2 million. This will be determined after the expression of interest, but before the application stage. 
the cost share ratio is 50%. This means that if your project cost exceeds $2 million or $4 million, you will only be reimbursed to the maximum of $1 million or $2 million. To be considered eligible for Stream 2, applicants must be BC-based and one of the organization types on this list. Please note that community water supply groups, including ind Indigenous groups that provide a combination of irrigation, drainage, or diking services to a mix of agricultural and non-agricultural water users are eligible unless specified as ineligible under the activity description. Public corporate bodies incorporated or formed under specific provincial legislations which allow them to legally acquire, hold, or control property and licenses and conduct works are also eligible. Ineligible participants include non-agricultural entities, federal or provincial governments, staking districts, crown corporations, producers, and more. Before we get into eligible activities, let's talk briefly about ineligible items. There are several ineligible activities. A condensed list is shown here. There are also ineligible items specific to each activity which will be noted. One ineligible item I want to highlight is irrigation systems funded under the Beneficial Management Practices Program. If you're looking for irrigation infrastructure related funding, please see the BMP program webpage. So what exactly is eligible under Stream 2? Within Stream 2, there are nine eligible activities. Each activity relates to a type of water infrastructure. Activity 1 is for projects related to agricultural dams and reservoirs. Activity 2 for dugouts and related storage infrastructure, etc. Each activity has specific eligible and ineligible items and costs, and we'll cover these one by one. So starting with activity one, which provides cost shared funding towards the rehabilitation and upgrade of agricultural dams and reservoirs. This includes dams with deficiencies where the owner has not been ordered to make repairs or lower the reservoir. These deficiencies are most often identified by the owner's consultant and they will often provide recommendations on how to remediate the dams. Please note that an assessment by the dam safety program is legally required before the work begins and when the upgrade is complete. If you intend to increase the size of the storage, you will also require authorization from the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship. Eligible activities under Activity 1 include construction costs like materials, machinery and equipment, pumping systems and watering troughs to keep cows out of reservoirs, fencing if installed with a pumping system, and other professional services associated with project supervision. Activity-specific ineligible costs include water distribution systems. Moving on to Activity 2 now. Activity 2 provides cost-shared funding towards the improvement, expansion, or new construction of dugouts and related storage infrastructure for irrigation and livestock watering, including rangeland. This could include projects like installing dugouts in areas with low flow water supplies to enhance supply during times of shortage, lining of dugouts to improve water holding capacity, and installing pumps and watering troughs to improve livestock watering and protect stream health. Eligible costs under activity two include construction related materials, power supplies to the farm property line, solar or wind power supplies, planting of trees or placing snow fencing, dugout aeration systems, pumping systems and watering troughs, fencing if installed with the pumping system or other professional services related to project supervision. Under activity two, water distribution systems and dugouts that are legally considered dams are ineligible. Activity three provides cost shared funding towards the cons new construction of other water storage infrastructure. New storage infrastructure will require authorization from the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship. Water use will need to be licensed for each purpose and any new storage infrastructure will require an engineering plan. Eligible costs under activity three include construction related costs, such as machinery, equipment, or materials, 
pumping systems and watering troughs to keep livestock out of the existing reservoir, provided the reservoir provides the secure water source in periods of drought, fencing if installed along with the pumping system, and other professional services associated with pro project supervision. Additional ineligible costs under this category include water distribution systems. Activity four will fund the improvement, expansion, or new construction of off-farm conversion of conveyance ditches to pipelines where savings of 30 to 50% can be achieved. Water demand will increase with climate change, but adding water storage to supplement demand is not always an option. This activity supports projects which aim to use existing water supplies more efficiently, create new delivery systems to provide better water access, and reduce conveyance losses and provide water to the farm through pipelines. Eligible activities and costs under Activity 4 include materials and construction for source development and mainline distribution systems, electric power line extension if required for an existing diesel pump or a new pump, and other professional services associated with the project supervision. Activity-specific ineligible costs include membership or share cost for tie-in to an existing pipeline, troughs, tanks, hydrants in the yard, livestock pens or barns, on-farm water distribution systems, and back flood irrigation works. Activity 5 funds the improvement, expansion, or new construction of water delivery systems to the farm gate from off-farm storage infrastructure and licensed intakes on the streams. This includes expansion of water distribution systems. Eligible activities and costs under Activity 4 include materials and construction for source development and mainline distribution systems, electric power line extension if required for an existing diesel pump or a new pump, other professional services associated with the project supervision. Activity specific ineligible costs include membership or share costs for tie into an existing pipeline, crops, tanks, hydrants in the yard, livestock, pens or barns, on-farm water distribution systems, and back flood irrigation works. Activity six will fund the extension of an existing water purveyor network to expand water supply to additional agricultural lands. Eligible activities and expenditures include mainline distribution system materials and construction costs, such as trenching or augering under roads, canals, or water courses, electric power line extensions if required for a pump that brings water from the off-farm water supply source to the farm property line and other professional services associated with the project supervision. Ineligible activities and costs include membership or cost share uh, or share cost for tie into an existing pipeline, troughs, tanks, hydrants in the yard, livestock pens or barns, and on-farm water distribution systems. Activity seven will fund the development of new water purveyed systems to agricultural land. Eligible costs include materials and construction for source development and mainline distribution systems, electric power line extensions to the off-farm water supply line if required to bring water to the farm property line and other professional services associated with the project supervision. Activity specific ineligible costs for this activity include membership or share costs for tie-in to an existing pipeline, troughs, tanks, hydrants in the yard, livestock pens or barns, on-farm water distribution systems, and back flood irrigation works. So before we continue with activities eight and nine, I want to talk briefly about the regulatory requirements and go over the requirements for activities one to seven as they are very similar. All projects are required to meet the regulatory requirements for the activities they are applying under, and these are listed by activity on the program webpage. Generally, this is going to involve the applicant providing some sort of document that shows how they meet the requirement. For activities one to seven, you will require a water license for the proposed use of the water source, as such as irrigation from an aquifer or stream, a water license for the proposed storage volume, change approval to make changes in and about a stream if applicable to your project and easement if applicable. 
Additionally, under activities one and three, you will also require an assessment approval or authorization from the dam safety program. Under activity six, you will require approval for purveyed boundary changes. And under activity seven, you will require documentation of current boundaries as well as approval for any changes. And if you're wondering if you need a water license for a dugout, please review the authorization requirements for storage and use of water in dugouts document, which is linked on Stream 2's webpage. Hopping back into the last two activities, Activity 8 will fund the installation of meters where a universal agricultural water metering program is being implemented by a water purveyor. Eligible costs under this activity include purchase and installation costs of meters for agricultural users, other associated parts and materials such as pipes and valves, et cetera, and professional, super, professional services associated with project supervision. Activity-specific ineligible costs include meters for non-agricultural users. Under Activity 8, applicants must provide documentation that shows easements, if applicable, the current purveyed boundaries, and approval for any changes. Finally, we come to Activity 9, which is the most detailed. Funding under Activity 9 is intended to protect agricultural land from flooding using effective diking and drainage infrastructure. Under this activity, we are looking for projects that consider flood hazards and the impacts of climate change in the community, help mitigate the risk of future disasters associated with natural hazards and climate change, do not compromise the safety of other dikes or increase risk of flooding, ensure flood protection is not diminished during potential flood periods, and implement measures during construction to ensure that the dike functions as designed and are planned and constructed to meet environment needs. Please note, this isn't an eligibility list, just an example of the types of projects that this activity is aiming to fund. Within Activity 9, there are some rules about the ownership of the infrastructure and associated assets. Applicants must have the authority or ownership to develop implement, maintain, and operate the proposed project and include plans for its operations and maintenance. The applicant will need to maintain ongoing operations and retain title to and ownership of the infrastructure in perpetuity. An exception may be made to transfer ownership to another local government. And if the applicant is not the owner of the infrastructure, ownership must be transferred to the applicant before project completion. Eligible costs include materials and construction costs for the comprehensive flood control systems, which could include culverts, pipes, flood boxes, utility lines, pump stations, pump discharge lines, and more. Electric power line extensions, if required to remove water from farmland within the floodplain. This may include upgrading from a single phase to a three phase connection if the pump upgrade requires three phase and other professional services associated with the project supervision, such as those in the Dyke Maintenance Act approvals. Activity-specific ineligible costs include dike or drainage infrastructure to support non-agricultural activities, construction of evacuation roads or structures, routine or ongoing operations and maintenance, flood mitigation projects that yield only temporary measures, such as sandbagging or log jam removal, debris or sediment removal, and on-farm water distribution or collection systems. Please note that under Activity 9, diking districts and improvement districts are ineligible for diking infrastructure improvement or expansion to align with provincial policy direction of dike safety management pertaining to the construction of dikes. Please refer to the diking authorities for new dikes policy for details. This applies only to the diking infrastructure projects proposed under diking districts or improvement districts under Stream 2 Activity 9. Under Activity 9, like the other activities, applicants are required to meet a set of regulatory requirements. This includes obtaining all applicable regulatory approvals, authorizations, and permits for the proposed construction under the Dike Maintenance Act. Approvals or authorizations are made by the Ministry of Water, Land, and Resource Stewardship. 
ensuring the proposed infrastructure adheres to dike design and construction guidelines and follow the local, regional, provincial, and federal standards. These include standards and guidelines about best management practices, sea dikes, seismic designs, riprap design and construction, vegetation management, and more. Ensuring the construction work complies with the Drainage, Ditch, and Dike Act and obtain approvals under the Fisheries Act, Water Sustainability Act, or other applicable legislation and bylaws. In addition to regulatory requirements, projects under Stream 2 must also comply with any pre-construction requirements that are applicable to the project. Each activity has pre-construction requirements. These requirements often refer to assessments, studies, or design plans by qualified professionals. To give you an example of what this requirement looks like, imagine you're applying to upgrade a dam under Activity 1. You would require an engineering assessment or plan by someone who is qualified to make such a plan, such as an engineer with dam-related experience. This would need to be complete before you apply to Stream 2. And due to the wide range of professionals that may be applicable to the many different types of projects that are eligible under this program, IAF does not provide a list of qualified professionals. Instead, applicants are encouraged to visit professional association websites to search for folks who can provide professional consultative services specific to the needs of the proposed project. For example, engineers and geoscientists of British Columbia or the British Columbia Institute of Agrologists. Please note it's the professional ethics and responsibility of qualified professionals to determine if their area of expertise or practice is best suited to the project. And if you aren't sure what assessment, study, or design you will need to complete for your project, the ministry has provided several resources to help you determine that. These include authorization requirements for storage and use of water in dugouts, guidance on farm water storage, BC Agriculture Water Calculator, BC Farm Water Dugouts, and you may also contact the Dam Safety Program for more details. The contents of these assessments or studies or designs will depend heavily on the specific project activities you plan to undertake. Some examples include details about pipeline specifications, river crossings, water use requirements, dugout dimensions, and more. Detailed specifications and helpful links for each activity are available online. If you do not currently meet the pre-construction requirements, meaning you do not have an eligible assessment, plan, or design as required by the activity you are applying under, you are currently ineligible for Stream 2. However, Stream 3 of AWP provides cost-shared funding towards those very plans and designs you may require. Check out Stream 3's webpage for more details. Please note, you do not have to complete this plan or design through Stream 3, and all plans and designs must be considered valid and current at the time of application to Stream 2. So that wraps up the details for Stream 2. Now that you have an idea about what you can apply for, let's talk about how to apply. Applicants can apply to AWP through the IAF client portal. Links to the portal are provided throughout IAF's website and listed on the slides here. To find the application, log into your account and select the Funding Opportunities tab from the gray sidebar, noted in yellow here. Once on this page, scroll down to find the Application button for the Agriculture Water Infrastructure Program. Once you've drafted and saved an application, it will appear under the Applications Draft Applications section of the portal, noted in blue here. Applications for Stream 2 will be accepted through a two-step process. First, applicants will complete an Expression of Interest, or EOI. Applicants with approved EOIs will then be invited to complete a full application. EOIs are currently available to draft and can be submitted until July 24th at 4 p.m. IAF estimates invitations to apply will go out in September. And if your project is approved following a full application, your project may begin as soon as you receive an approval letter from IAF. Projects should be completed within five years of the project start date and all projects funded under AWP 
must be complete by January 15, 2032. Applications will be reviewed and prioritized based on three criteria. The full prioritization criteria is now available online. Equal priority will be given to priority one, water issues, and priority two, benefits. Priority three, project support is a secondary priority. Under water issues, the program will consider the severity of water constraint or risk for the watershed. Under benefits, the program will consider the significance of the project benefit to agricultural production and the term of the proposed solutions. And under project support, the program will consider the level of support or endorsement, financial or otherwise, for the project. During your application to Stream 2, you'll be asked to identify your watershed which will be used to evaluate your application. On the website and application form, there is a link which takes you to a map indicated here. As we are directing folks to an external site, we want to provide a brief overview of how to use the map provided. As you can see, there are areas of the map that are color-coded indicating watersheds and their priority. Tier one is red and include watersheds where temporary protection orders have been issued. Tier 2 is yellow and includes watersheds where temporary protection orders have been contemplated, and Tier 3 is pink and includes watersheds on the regional stream watch lists. And Tier 4 is for all other watersheds not listed in Tier 1, 2, or 3. Tier 4 watersheds are not highlighted on this map. If you click on the watershed your project is in, the side panel will provide you with the information you need to complete your application. And if your firm is located in a non-highlighted area, you would be tier four and would enter other into the application instead of a watershed name. Keep in mind there's several prioritization criteria as we just discussed. And if your watershed is tier four, that should not deter you from applying to the program. So thank you everybody. Um, that wraps up the presentation portion of the webinar, and we will move on to the question and answer section. And if you have a specific question you would like to discuss with the IAF team, please reach out to awp at iafbc.ca or find a link on the AWP webpage to book a consultation call. Okay, and with that, I'll begin our question and answer section. So the first one is, if we're waiting for approval or permissions from a dam safety officer to carry out our project, are we still able to apply? Uh, so the answer here is, you may still apply if your permits are pending or under review, and IAF will review the application. But any approval would be conditional until all of the required documentation, including permits, is received. And applicants with conditional approvals will not be contracted and won't be able to incur expenses or begin their project activities until their project has met all the conditions of approval, which includes having all required permits in place. Okay, are on-farm water lines or conveyance systems eligible under Stream 2? So in general, costs related to on-farm water lines and conveyance systems would be considered on-farm water distribution systems, which are ineligible under Stream 2. However, if the water line is off farm and um, up to the farm gate, those costs could be eligible depending on the project. Like an example of this would be if a project was to bring water to a farm from a water source off farm, the pipeline from the source to the farm gate could be eligible, but the pipeline portion that's on farm would not be eligible through this program. Can you apply for funding under more than one activity category? Um, the answer there is yes. Applicants may apply for eligible costs under multiple activities within a stream in one application, provided the entire project is within the funding limits. So yeah, you can apply to multiple act, uh, more than one activity category within your stream two application. We have a question about the differences between activity four and five. So the two activities, activities four and activity five, fund different types of water infrastructure. Activity four is for the conversion of conveyance ditches to pipelines. For example, 
if there's a ditch filled with water that's converted into pipelines, whereas activity five is for the new construction of water delivery systems up to the farm gate. So this will not be converted into pipelines, but the water will be drawn from the water body and moving it to the farm. So I'm not sure if there's anything else one of the other specialists would like to jump in there on the difference between activities four or five. Well, activity four is converting from a ditch system to a pipe system, and that will give you anywhere between 30 to 50% improvement in water use efficiency, whereas activity five is about delivering water from off-stream storage infrastructure or license intake on stream to the individual farms. So it's really about the general water delivery system for activity five. Thank you, Stephanie. So the next question is about how applicants actually get approvals from the ministry. So depending on the approval required, there are different processes. All approval requirements and processes can be found in the program guide and on the web page. But since I have a panel of specialists here, I wondered if you'd like to briefly go over how, for example, you would go about the water licensing or getting the dam safety authorizations in place if the applicants doesn't have them at this time. Sure, I'll uh, mention the water licensing side of it. Um, water license applications are received by the province through Front Counter BC. If people already have licenses and if they need to make an amendment to those licenses, they can apply for that amendment through Front Counter. Or if they need a brand new license, uh, it'll also be received through Front Counter. And once you get into the system for making that application, it'll you can determine which one you need, whether it's an amendment or a new one, and then you can enter all the details that way and they'll be captured and then moved forward onto the uh, appropriate water allocation office around the province. Thanks, Ray. David, did you want to provide any guidance for applicants who are looking for um, the dam authorizations? Sure. Thanks, Alana. And the question uh, asker, it, it's very similar to the process that Ray outlined. Basically, that process is what you would follow to kickstart a review by a dam safety officer. And internally, uh, there would be a referral to your regional local dam safety officer to look over and make requirements as they see fit. And, and there's no additional process other than you would probably have to work directly with the dam safety officer to come up with a plan. Thank you, David. And Queenie, did you want to add anything regarding the dike safety process? So any changes near the dike or any new dikes or near any changes near the dike, we require a dike maintenance act approval. And there's a, a link that you can apply for the dike maintenance act. It's not through Fun Canca PC. Do we have the link at the program guide? Yeah, we okay. do have the link in the program guide as well as the website. Thanks, Stephanie. Okay, um, the next question has to do with an applicant um, who's asking, are they able to apply if they haven't received their water license yet? So if your water license is pending approval, you are still able to apply to the program. However, if your project um, is you know, approved for funding, you would get a conditional approval um, which means you would not um, be able, you would not get a contract, you wouldn't be able to start the project, you wouldn't be able to incur costs until you have that water license and your project would move from conditional approval to approved. So yes, you are able to apply, but we wouldn't be able to fully approve and contract for that project until such a time as all required permits, including water licenses are in place. Okay, so I have one more question here. If we're waiting for our pre-construction designs but are working with engineers, are we still able to apply? Um, so these those engineered designs are a required component to begin the application process for um, Stream 2. So these would need to be submitted with your initial application. I think this is for Ray. What is the current wait time for water license approval? That is a good question. The wait times are quite long at the moment. There is a very large backlog of the existing use groundwater licenses that came in. So those are a uh, those are a priority that my ministry is working on. They have a special task force team working on those. 
water license applications for this program are going to be prioritized. So within water, land and resource stewardship, we have myself and another person who are working specifically on these applications that are coming in through this IAF funding opportunity. The province recognizes that because of the drought related nature of a lot of these applications, they are a very high priority. And so they're, they are going to be prioritized uh, as they come in. So. Well, on that note, I think we've got into all of the active questions that have come in. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Special thanks to, to the panelists, Stephanie, Ray, David, and Queenie. Thank you so much for joining us and providing the information today to applicants. And a reminder to anybody who didn't get your question in today, please do reach out to us at awp at iafbc.ca or book a consultation call through the webpage and would be happy to follow up with you to support your applications. Thanks, everybody, and thanks again. Bye.